<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening or this morning, wherever you happen to be. And uh, this is our monthly um, studio talk that we're so happy to be continuing with after starting during the pandemic. And um, so in these talks, as you know, we try to bridge some of the gaps between yoga and um, kind of daily life, even though those gaps are pretty much imaginary, as are many things. Um, but many of us either get so trapped in daily life that, you know, the, the yoga is, is sort of separate from our lives, or we get so wrapped up in the dogma and theory and practices of yoga that our lives become um, sort of not so well integrated with other things. And our aim, and as we've gotten older and our practices reflect this idea of joining those two parts of how we approach things um, and really seeing how daily life supports the yoga practice, how the yoga practice supports daily life, and how the theories in yoga, the philosophy, the teachings, as well as the practices, um, support us in daily life. And so the topic that we are approaching um, was inspired this time uh, by a project that we've been working on since actually the beginning of the pandemic. And it is a project where we were looking at um, how do we embody both uh, the Brahma Viharas or the capacity to um, see others and see ourselves in a way that's a sort of short form of what the Brahma Viharas are. And um, how do we feel happy? And so many topics along this line have, have bubbled up over the course of time as we wrote this book. And the book turned out to be very small, which is what we wanted it to be. But it took inordinately long to write. Very long pamphlets. It's yeah. a long pamphlet. Yeah. And because we were trying to not use jargon and get real heady about everything and wanted it to be clear. So this is, is kind of an outpouring from that work. And so I think the topic is something like the yoga of freedom uh, from isolation. And that topic is sort of a play on words where it's freedom from isolation or freedom from isolation, um, meaning you can either be free of being isolated through yoga, feeling isolated, or uh, is there a way that being isolated can bring you a sense of freedom? So that's what we're playing with as we talk. And we also thought of this topic because uh, what has been fascinating to watch, and it was compounded during the pandemic, is the feeling within people all over the world of isolation and loneliness, to the point that uh, recently, in the last year, the World Health Organization has declared uh, loneliness and isolation a public health concern. Um, and the Surgeon General of the United States has even spoken of it as an epidemic. Um, and when you read about this, and it's you know, easy to Google it and see what's intended by all of this mm. uh, from the World Health Organization and from the Surgeon General, really what um, the emphasis has been on is the lack of connection. Um, and so they identify isolation as lack of connection, and that that over time in the last while has uh, really deteriorated. And, um, and yet, still, in the yoga view of things, you know, we all know, any of us who have practiced it, the, practiced over time, the value of isolation, the value of going into a retreat setting or away from the everyday hustle and bustle of life 
Um, so we thought maybe what we could do in the beginning is to look at what is it that the yoga teachings can teach us about isolation and then come back and say, well, how does that then impact us today? Yeah. Oh, so. Yeah, this it's a point of, I guess it's almost an astonishing confusion in yoga, the, uh, particularly in the yoga sutra, where the complete freedom or enlightenment is called kaivalyam, um, which is usually translated or interpreted uh, as uh, being totally alone or totally having totally let go of everything. Um, and then that's interpreted as, you know, particularly the universe, which is a miserable place uh, because it's so impermanent. And, uh, and then the classic examples of, you know, sages sitting uh, occasionally on mountain tops, or that usually doesn't last, or in valleys, or... Um, and, you know, ex ext or going into different states of samadhi for weeks at a time. <laughs> and then, you know, in the bardos, after they die, then, and the universe stops manifesting, there they are. Finally, I'm alone. And, uh, and all of it implies a certain, uh, not all of many different varieties imply a kind of disgust for everything. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's impermanent, it's not any good, I'm getting away from it. And uh, it's, uh, I think if you look closely at what's actually taught, uh, that's a, a misinterpretation. Um, there's, um, and so I'm just thinking of the word itself, kaivalyam. Uh, kai, uh, Kailas, I think of Kailas, which is uh, the, actually the peak of uh, Mount Everest um, in the Himalayas. And it's considered that's where Shiva, who's, uh, you know, one of the... Uh, big guys. Yeah, you know, big, big, guy, big guy. Shiva lives on Kailash and uh, does his thing. And, uh, and it basically it means the, the peak or the, you know, this is like it. The Kaivalyam means you, you, you got the peak of things. And, uh, and then, of course, we hear that and we want the peak. I got to make a pilgrimage to the peak. And uh, uh, what happens is, is that uh, we don't really see clearly. And the whole teaching is to allow you to actually develop this kind of intelligent seeing of things. And so there's a famous phrase that always pops into my mind, and I'm not sure. It's uh, about Kaivalyam, uh, and it, I think it's in Bengali. Kaivalyam narakayate tridashapur akasha pushpayate. And it's, it's very cool. It means that uh, Kaivalyam is hell. Okay. <laughs> and so this is the advice that all of the... Uh, uh, yoga communities that are involved with love or other beings, uh, even the, the bodhisattvas and the, uh, they think, and they're looking at, you know, this misinterpretation and they're kind of lecturing the yogis that that would be hell, you know, like, uh, just let me away, get away from all of this stuff. Uh, and then it says, but also the, the three, the Tridashapur, which are the three, the three worlds, which as we know, the three gunas, mm -hmm. uh, the three qualities of all manifestation are the gunas, that, the, that those are merely flowers in the sky, uh, which is also like, oh, that sounds, sounds very Buddhist. And so, uh, and what it's, the saying is trying to do is trying to think, oh, well, that the, the three worlds, um, if you actually practice, um, you'll start to see that the three worlds are actually um, quite fascinating and beautiful. And then when you 
are actually able to appreciate even the smallest little minutia or the greatest pattern or within uh, nature or within your own mind, uh, then you're looking at uh, the three gunas all of a sudden have flipped in perception to they are this divine mystery. They are this kaivalyam. Uh, and with the three gunas, people become very often, a, you know, sort of have one of them that they think is their favorite or is the one they should aspire to, even <laughs> though maybe they've read the verse about it being uh, one of three flowers in the sky. And that's, that's so often what then yeah. trips us up, I yeah. think. And it, and it can happen and it, all the time. Even to somebody who's got <laughs> got it together, okay, really, is just the nature of mind. Is it? It does a little. I think. Oh, that's that's a beautiful state, and it takes it takes a selfie of that. You know, here I am on mountaintop with uh, you know, holding my or my breath is suspended in samadhi, but somehow my iPhone comes out. And I, I, <laughs> taking selfies. <laughs> and this is the natural functioning of the gunas. Of one of the, of the gunas. gunas. Yeah, one of the gunas so is the selfie guna. Yeah. That's a whole new Is that a whole new guna? So yeah. it's Rajas, Sattva, and Thomas, and <laughs> we got to think of a good name for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then that, that leaves you with all these different qualities of... Uh, craving after this ideal of aloneness. It's some ideal that you are pursuing in your mind, which we discover is pretty natural, because uh, we all make, you know, I would like, you know, this thing. And, uh, and it's often we have an image of it. I would like to feel better uh, for my yoga practice, but we have these images of like, when I really get it together, my skin tingles and feels like this beautiful gold tingling. And then you do something and the tingling is there and the amazing, there's something amazing there, but it doesn't look like your picture of it. And so you become not satisfied. And so we uh, are unable to really perceive uh, what's right, you know, what's right in front of our eyes. Or in front of the eyes is a metaphor because it's right what is tingling in your skin or uh, what you're actually experiencing. And so the, there are the senses, and then there's also the phenomenon of mind. And even when we're in a difficult state of mind, which I don't know if you've ever had one, um, we don't... Uh, pause, and somehow there's, and this is the pause, and feel it, uh, and appreciate it as it's in its uniqueness. Um, and so we can't really pay attention to it. And then the, the whole idea in the traditional teachings, uh, Buddhist and uh, yoga teaching, is pay attention mm -hmm. uh, to what is actually happening. And that's so hard to do. And but even noticing the difficulty you have, it's like, oh, notice. So. Yeah. And you were saying yesterday when we were talking about this, a little bit about how part of the confusion, you know, when we get trapped, you know, it, it's almost a little bit scary um, to sort of trust and turn in towards and give into this sort of absorption in these gunas, mm. in sattva, rajas, and tamas, and seeing their interplay. And there's this tendency to then uh, really have a difficult time not grasp, either running away from it or grasping onto something like Sankhya theory that yes. is you know, rooted in attention to the gunas. And you were talking about an interesting thing about Raj, about uh, Prakriti and Purusha and the confusion 
of that. <laughs> That's quite something. That's a classic yeah. confusion. So, and this is, Hindus have claimed this as being orthodox, but Sankhya is, Sankhya, which just means counting, that's when you're making categories, uh, is a very old, old school that everyone loves to criticize. And it's, but it's based in a metaphor of Purusha and Prakriti. Prakriti is that which does, and it's creative energy. And Purusha just means, uh, basically, it's male. I mean, it's, you can't get away from these metaphors, but um, it's merely awareness, pure awareness. And it's male in that the word Yeah, is it's male. just the word. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but the paradox that everyone, you know, no, or few people actually see, but it, is, it comes and hits you in the face, uh, is that the, if everything is prakriti, the idea of purusha is also prakriti. Um, and uh, the idea of kaivalyam that's made out of so everything is made of prakriti, and then we say, oh, but then there's pure awareness. But the word pure awareness is also prakriti. And the concept of God, or the concept of nirvana, or the concept all of these things, they are 100% composed of prakriti. Yet, prakriti is uh, you can't say what it is, because whatever you say it is, that's also composed of prakriti. And so it's a delightful paradox that most people cannot bear. And so you're talking about this um, trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and the classical word is shraddha, meaning I'm able to come and, and when you're with the right people or the right time of day, you're fine with, ah, <laughs> just exhaling and the mind goes into this state of not having to know and you just feel the, uh, I hate to say, the fizz, uh, the fizz of prakriti, the, of the blossoming of all of the, in Buddhist terms, of all of the dharmas uh, blossom like clouds, you know, all of the different levels, and it's like this. And what it does is take, literally takes your breath and is, uh, about this term is out of date, but it's as awesome. Isn't there a more modern term? Awesome? Maybe amazing. That's Southern color. Amazing? I don't know. I, we're not very... Yeah, we're not in style anymore, Don't ask but us if you have a question about what's in And these the days. breath is taken, and you're just like... And, and if you try to say what can't be said, there you are. And it's, and it's, it's a real feeling in the body. And it, a, totally. a sense of sort of merging where you yourself, in a sense, you, you know, your awareness of self fades into the background, maybe completely fades away. Um, and it's, it, it is this feeling that is, you know, this is isolation, but it is also absolutely um, connected. So it's an, it's yeah. isolation without isolation. lack of connection. Yeah, and the term isolation is funny, yeah. um, but it's it's just like you. So there are people who think that once you get your enlightenment or something, <laughs> saying bye to everything, all your friends, <laughs> and then all other beings. But no, this way you experience and and into this sense of fascination and awe with actually what's going on, mm -hmm. uh, you're including, you're taking all beings with you into isolation. Yeah. Which is, that's the beautiful part of the paradox. You know, you're, you're taking those who are beloved, and then eventually, <laughs> even the irritating ones. Reluctantly. Yeah, reluctantly. And it's not that... Um, and so it's not at all lonely in the 
uh, Kai Valium, yeah. which, and that's why a lot of schools will criticize yoga. Oh, you're just into loneliness. You, you people are. And people okay. get there too. I mean, that's yeah, and, and that's a valid criticism. It is a valid, and it's a common misinterpretation, and that trap happens with, uh, in different yoga schools and different Buddhist schools also, and different in all religions. There, are these misunderstandings where it becomes quite uh, antithetical or against most beings. Definitely, and it's kind of sad. And that's what I would call that, you know, isolation yeah. happening. And and a sense of confusion, and it, and it's rooted, it seems, in fear, and and not so much a direct mm. fear of, you know, anything in in particular, but a fear of of that sense of merging and the sense of oneself. Um, and the identity with oneself um, disappearing. And it, it's fascinating to see how, no matter what situation any of us find ourselves in, um, that sort of knee-jerk reaction to certain things that, that are unfamiliar or that are challenging or that are... Um, not our own ideas that are someone else's ideas, how they can, you know, how we can have a knee-jerk reaction into a sense of pulling back. And, right, and just a survival reaction, yeah. which is kind of the way the, being a, you know, living inside of a body or yeah. living as a body, say inside is too dualistic. Um, but, uh, and it's, it's an organism that needs keep some <laughs> some boundary until it's, finally it, you you know it's decomposing then boundaries break away and it's just like here in the jungle that you'll come across something that uh, <laughs> wraps around your leg <laughs> <laughs> pulls your feet out from under you <laughs> <laughs> and the initial response is <laughs> and that's that's actually <laughs> if it's not deadly, it's good. <laughs> yeah. It's just the love of the jungle for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But the sense, you know, this practice of becoming isolated um, is one that we run in, you know, into questions from students about. Is, you know, how do you then uh, have moments where you can be or periods in your life where you can be in a retreat or really truly isolate yourself and then what do you do to bring that out into the world and there's mm. so many stories again yesterday you were talking about you know all these you know sages who go off into the forest thinking oh that's classic yeah. in uh, a lot of the uh, myths is um, a king uh, would, you know, getting older, decide, well, it's, you know, I'm getting old <laughs> and body isn't working, so I'm going to go off to the forest, which is a orthodox practice. You become a forest dweller and then a, perhaps a uh, renunciate. But in the forest, um, and some of them do well, they, but oftentimes uh, they'll go into different states of concentration and but then they become very and they become hypersensitive and you'll meet you'll see sadhus like this in India. Uh, they can go off and they become very concentrated. But as soon as they uh, get close to a city or something, they become just disgusted and almost enraged at uh, how stupid all these human beings are. And, and so the classic myths are that the king will go off, the queen, uh, who actually is enlightened, <laughs> goes and she takes on the, the uh, 
uh, duties of the and her and she's working you know and it's actually very good and finally uh, the uh, king will run into an actual someone in the forest uh, who says oh you know why don't you uh, look look around you and then the oftentimes the king will then return uh, to get back to doing his duty which is really to serve uh, other people uh, in all their different stages and you know within the, the kingdom and then he's considered like oh he, he got the purpose of yeah and that's really the freedom that we're talking and about free. right that, yeah he actually has kaivalyam rather than yeah that you're free from not only are you free from uh, sort of your own self torture but you are free in the sense that you are part of this real sort of system that is alive and working, rather than you know being the ruler, rather than being the outsider, yeah. rather than being the servant. Yeah. Although, as a king, you then see your need for service, or as you being anyone, serve. you yeah. want to serve. Yeah, and you can actually be helpful and and you're actually helpful in a a way without attachment to mm -hmm. you know knowing completely because um, you make a theory about what would help these people you know those those people over there and and you try it and then you watch because you're you're paying attention to all the feedback and you're paying attention to the your phenomenon in your own mind. And if it doesn't work, you'll change your diagnosis. <laughs> no problem. And so it, it really supports this whole idea of uh, science. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting to see how this idea of isolation then becomes kind of muddled with the notion of loneliness First, aloneness, which it is, and then how loneliness transforms, how aloneness transforms into what would be called loneliness. And then loneliness, mm. you know, creates anxiety and sadness and sometimes depression or, you know, hypersensitivity, etc. And how, you know, not only in the modern world, but how in ancient times, this is part of how the human process of understanding things kind of evolves. Um, and when you look at what it is that is the, one of the primary roots of the suffering, loneliness being a kind of suffering, it is the, um, from the yogic perspective, it is, uh, the confusion of not seeing interconnectedness, not seeing yourself as part of something far bigger than um, you know you realize it to be. Yeah, not seeing, not and seeing including not feeling. Yeah, not um, that and, and connectedness. The, the moment you develop that sense of separateness, and the ego arises. Because you're separate, and the ego's—that's the ego's job—is to take care of itself. Um, and then you start grasping and pushing away things, and getting fearful of things, etc. And it becomes a, a, and you can do this with the gunas. You know, you can do this with other people. You can do this with your uh, social media feed. You can do it with whatever is your object of attention uh, when your own storyline of self is, has taken hold. And that's, to, I believe, that's one of the primary ways that from the yogic perspective and everyday perspective that the isolation becomes something that is less beneficial because you've you know, you are really I taking it literally, in a sense, um, isolating 
not connecting, putting up boundaries, building the wall around yourself. Yeah, building the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keeping others out. Um, yeah, some of the, the, the most problematic characters in the mythology are basically um, often very people who are very religious um, and extremely egotistical. So they um, and so they use the you know the desires that people develop in their religion too. Um, and so Ravana, who was yeah. had ten heads. He was and he was knew all the mantras. He knew all the you know he had all everything the down. And he was really not a very nice person because yeah. he just wanted to be above all, all beings, yeah. uh, sit on the throne, so to speak. And so he was the kind of the archetype of a, a number of, you know, and we all have this in ourselves. And so when we meet our own Ravana, you just got to look because it's look more deeply. Uh, and then when you meet him out on the... Uh, Another's Ravana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In world events at yeah. the moment. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, somehow, you know, you want to see, hey, keep a clear vision. Yeah. Because then there's the possibility of being of service, of yeah. doing something. And so, at the beginning of this talk, we, we mentioned the idea in modern times of, you know, the, the Surgeon General and the World Health Organization, which I think is fascinating, um, putting mm -hmm. effort and energy into this idea of loneliness and isolation. And uh, that isolation be f being defined as lack of connection. And yet, you know, from the yogic perspective, the yoga of things is there. You are always connected uh, with everything else. Everything is interconnected. What happens and causes the suffering is that you become confused and you don't feel that or you don't see it. And especially now in this day and age, uh, one of the things that's really difficult for people to do is, and I think it probably always has been, but maybe maybe more so now, is to, to truly what you might call embody this sense of merging, this, this physical, mental, uh, heartfelt sense of what is it that allows me to feel the mental version as well, of what is it that allows me to merge and, uh, and sort of disappear in terms of my own identity so that I can have this sense of connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this mm. is really important for all of us to spend time thinking about, and this is why it feels to Richard and me that that the yoga asana in particular, the breathing practices, the pranayama, the chanting, um, they are so vital in terms of joining together these aspects of the body and the heart and the mind um, so that we can have that sort of blissful, amazing sense of merging with what's there. And, you know, what's fascinating when I was reading up on the modern, you know, World Organiz Health Organization, et cetera, and recommendations by um, the Surgeon General, is that the recommendations are wonderful. They are really uh, talking explicitly about trying to find ways of connecting, building social structures, building your ability to connect to other people and to have meaning in your life. But the thing that seems missing even still in that is this connection to yourself, to the truth of 
who you are um, so that there isn't a need for reinforcement from others or validation from others. Yeah, and that will help overcome the... You can say, oh, just join a community. And, uh, and that's good. That's often good in, from the point of view of becoming more functional. Mm -hmm. But the, the communities uh, might be um, a, a, a kind of strong identity that uh, will then take away your... It's like join the team. <laughs> and so you become... And that's not a bad thing. No, it's a phenomenon. Yeah, yeah but it can be a bad yeah. thing. I'm yeah. Thinking of. But to actually feel it, you know, through your own core, mm -hmm. uh, that's... Uh, and that's when you... You know, you feel that... It's, it's not a connection to so much... It, it's somehow the heartfelt mm -hmm. community, you know, the to others, uh, to other beings. It doesn't have to be just people, any being. You, you actually feel it in your heart, and that takes the breath. Mm -hmm. um, and so, whatever can encourage. Yeah. yeah. And yet, at the same time, and this is, I, I grew up as a sort of melancholy child, and um, you know, was always worried about everything. But at the same time, as a kid, I, the, I have vivid memories of really, like there was this one tiny, tiny little flower that I used to see. And it had in the very center, it was a weed growing up in Florida. It was, and I remember just sitting around staring at the grass or the stars or whatever. But this was a little tiny flower. And in the very center was a um, kind of brownish area. And then hundreds and hundreds of teeny weeny little uh, sort of petals that came out from it. Um, at this stage of my life with my eyes, I probably would just see it as a blur, but fortunately I was young. And so it really sort of represented from an early age to me how there is this sort of, sort of microcosm of the macrocosm it apparent in anything that we might on all the different in, in scales. any direction we might look. And so that was always very, very real to me. And yet and I could feel that. I, I have memories of, you know, feeling so that heartfelt thing you were just talking about. And yet you step out into the world and the truth is, you know, to to only reach out to a community or join a community. Um, has the drawback that unless the other people in the community are also uh, undefended, if you join in a, in a defended way, or if you join in a suspicious way, cult, yeah. um, unless the other people are also undefended, if you join in an undefended way, you then, it becomes a sort of tragic situation. And that, I think, is one of the reasons there is this surge in loneliness these days. Because people, there is this growing sense in students and uh, friends and others whom we meet, non-yoga people, that there is this real deep desire to connect to the world and to other people, almost as if there is this shift going on where people really want to be part of a whole that is healthy, rather than what we, so many of us, are experiencing, being part of a whole that is the whole world that has some big problems in it. And so if you find yourself in situations where the others that you're attempting to connect to are not uh, turning up with the same authenticity that you're bringing, um, it can be, you know, it can lead into these pits of the mind spiraling and losing the connection. And so, 
And I brought up being melancholy as a kid because I would talk to my father about this sort of thing, and he was a humanities professor and a great thinker, and he would launch into this thing of, oh, you know, you're having this existential crisis, and da da da. And it would be just <laughs> like, there would go down this iron door of, you know, that's not what I need. And so the same is true, because I needed something. It, yes, maybe that was true, but I needed to be seen. And I needed to really feel that embodied sense of connection. And so the danger with yoga mm -hmm. is that we do the same thing, that we have a, a dharma, that we have teachings that we can think about that are just phenomenal, like what you've been talking about. They're the best teaching. And we, and, yeah. we meet someone who's feeling desperately alone or desperately lonely, and we just say, you know, just do yoga, it'll help, or here's this theory, this is a stage we all go through, rather than saving that part <laughs> until they're ready at the appropriate, at the appropriate time. moment. Yeah, it's like with the practice, because you do a practice, then letting go of the practice, mm -hmm. is that's like, ah, uh, you focus and then you let go. That would be yeah. skillful. And, uh, and so we're learning. We're learning. Um, and, and I think all of the different schools of uh, identity and communities around the world uh, are, you know, we're just beginners in actually <laughs> appreciating the others. Uh, and then communicating. Yeah. And, so. you know, when we started thinking about this topic, um, and I was looking at what the medical field in the United States, the Surgeon General, which is a really valuable thing that they are doing, um, and they have, like, a, have developed a social communications uh, team, etc., and have all these ideas of how we can connect. Surgeon General pointing out that there are not only mental health problems associated with isolation and loneliness, but there are physical health, uh, physical health problems. Uh, something like, you know, it's associated, being lonely is associated with a shortened lifespan. Um, and it's with, with um, feelings of, let's see, I wrote some things down. Yeah, a 39% increase in heart disease, a 32% increase in stroke among people who um, had answered that they had feeling that they were had feelings of loneliness, um, a 50% chance of increased dementia. Um, and um, premature death for more than 60%. And, and really, it's right up there, like smoking uh, 15 cigarettes a day. Well, that which, was their number. That was the number they came up with. It's up there Same. with obesity and lack of exercise and all of that as a major health problem. And all of those things, you know, I know when I smoke 15 cigarettes a day that it's because I'm really stressed out and really uh, mm -hmm. not happy. Um, and that, that, that has nothing to do with um, anything other than really feeling this lack of connection outside, but also inside. And so the inside part seems to come mm -hmm. from becoming familiar with what it feels like to be embodied and feel whole. Um, and that takes individual effort to experiment with. What do I feel like when I feel whole, when I feel like myself? Where do I feel it? How do I breathe? How does the breath communicate that throughout the body? So getting embodied in that way, rather than getting embodied in necessarily putting the 
leg behind the head. And I hmm. have never smoked a cigarette in my life, but if I do, maybe I'll start with 15. Oh. <laughs> you could be missing out. <laughs> I could be missing out. I'm getting old. I should, should try it. Um, so the first thing really to do is to, to think about what does it mean when you feel embodied and when you feel something like loneliness or isolation apart from the theory of yoga um, how does that feel in the body and having a baseline of what that feels like so when you feel the connection you feel it emerging connection to everything yeah. Where do you feel it? Oh. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, because I'm the cushion I'm sitting on, I feel ah, uh, uh, the support of the cushion. Yeah. Um, and then you feel it all through your skin. Yeah. Um, it's, it's almost as if you'd uh, just jumped into a pool of water, <laughs> uh, that tingly. And so it's like, and so it could be anywhere. It could be, you know, Top of your head, or it could be your toes, um, through the breath. Um, so wherever there's sensation, there's that yeah. feeling of connection. Um, and then, and then the step of making the mind clear or training the mind to see things more clearly. So you embody, you get used to the body, and you train the mind to see things more clearly, which can be on the sitting cushion. It can start there, or it can evolve there. But the clarity of seeing, mm -hmm. um, how, do we, how do we cultivate that? Yeah. How, how do you do yeah. that? Well, once, well, the, the traditional thing is once you, you know, have this contact with uh, the body. And the breath. And the breath. Because the body really embodies all of your bad habits and holdings and things. Uh, then to be able to watch when the mind does something that's, which it occasionally does, it wanders <laughs> away from your, you know, your chosen religion of the moment, I'm just going to meditate on birds singing or something. And uh, to be able to watch that and to be able to stay with the sensation mm -hmm. in the body allows you then to stay with the, uh, to look at the mind without identifying so quickly. And so as if the mind is acting egotistical, which I hear they do, or neurotic, or <laughs> which I hear they psychotic, do. <laughs> or yeah, um, to be able to really go, wow, um, and uh, and to you know, then because if you've paid attention to the body to begin with, paid attention to movement of breath and the way you know disruptions in breath reflect disconnection sometimes. Um, then when you feel the, you know, when the mind is wandering and you say, hey, let me just check in with the body, you start seeing there's a bigger package than simply, let's train the mind, let's be clear in the mind, and then we go from there. Uh, that it is this ongoing process, um, which is kind of this wonderful thing that, it, you know, is what we're learning through the yoga, which is really what, when you get freedom within an isolated situation like a retreat or something, that's when that, that merging not only with the other that you were talking about, but mm. within yourself, that starts to, to really blossom. And then you can see the other person and you can show up authentically, which is critical it seems. Um, showing up 
which we all do from time to time and in different phases in our life, I think more so than other phases. Um, You know, when you don't show up in full, when you have an image you're trying to present to people um, and wanting them to see you for who you think you should or Mm -hmm. they want you to be. And, And really when you show up in that way, then if you check in with the embodied state, it's this feeling of of authenticity, of truth, of who you are deep inside that has nothing to do with your, your looks or your profession or your wealth or your standing in the world or your uh, knowledge base. It's this feeling of aha and release. <laughs> and, and that seems to be where finding people who can support you and see you and you see them, that's when that kind of community and connection. Yeah. So that's a very broad community. Yeah. And uh, but that I think traditionally is you have, you know, your cult community. They call it kula, which is the root of the word cult. And but the akula is every everybody. everybody. And so when we're feeling these feelings um, of loneliness or aloneness, which those are perfectly natural, you know, taking the steps to really uh, become embodied and and reach out and find others who are uh, reaching out in the same way so that you can, you know, do exactly the thing of making social connections. I was laughing about that idea because, you know, the idea is, oh, you know, World Health Organization says if we solve social connections, it will solve the problem. And you look at, like, social media, where there's a lot of social connection going on. And, you know, people have, you know, hundreds or thousands of followers on social media and are miserable because they're not really, um, they're just amassing. They're not really authentic ways of being. And those people who are able to be real in addition to that are pretty lucky to, yeah. to, to amassing things. Those influencers who are able to really be real and amass 250,000 uh, fan base, like. You know, some of the rock stars around, those are, you know, some of them are, are real. <laughs> so you may not be a rock star, but maybe you can be real. And then who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and we were uh, also talking but about... Don't they call that an avatar? When you're, yeah. Uh, the, well, they, that's yeah. the next step. Yeah. Right, your imaginary... The AI, yeah. yeah. We're going there. Yeah. <laughs> And also, I've been blabbing a lot more than usual tonight, so sorry about that. But I'm, I'm feeling really moved by this because we get people who are so tender coming to us these days uh, and so much wanting to really find <clears throat> a path to f- feel whole. And, um, you know, so much of it is this disconnection from self um, that the world has been perpetuating through things like social media. So, we have a puppy that lives next door. (laughs) And you you can't not connect with a puppy. Yeah, he insists. He insists. (laughs) And we have this amazing beautiful jungle outside and you can't help connecting with that and um, you know all of this other technique and all of that is valid but finding those little things like 
our little schnitzel who lives next door running up and, you know, having a conniption when he sees us. It just melts it all away. Hmm. Um, so find those kinds of things as well. Don't, don't treat it like a, um, like a syndrome or a problem. These things like loneliness or isolation that come up and make us feel uncomfortable, they are, they are the great gifts telling us, hey, it's time to pause, to breathe, to find truth and express truth. Yeah. Yeah. We should set them. Yeah. Okay. So that's our thinking on it. And we hope that you had a moment of social connection being here. Yeah, at least even yeah. online. Online. Connection. I go, That's wow. <laughs> so thank you so much. That's powerful. And we'll see you again next time. And please be well. <laughs> <laughs>